Hello, 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 planet Earth. My name is Andanichi Ijamune, and I am a graduate from the University of Linda. I was studying towards a Bachelor of Sciences in Botany and Zoology and Biochemistry and Microbiology. So I'll be giving you a collector talk on life on Earth. So on our habitable planet story, what do we know so far? So from our previous talk, not too hot, not too cold, we took Earth as a bare rock, and then we used modern equations to calculate its temperature which was found to be minus 18 degrees Celsius, making it way too cold to be habitable. Okay, so you have to understand, I am from Venda, and it's always 100 degrees out here. I can barely survive the temperature below that. Just imagine if I was staying in a planet with a temperature of minus 18 degrees Celsius. Okay. So we also drew a hypothesis that Earth is habitable because of its wide distance from the sun which was unfortunately falsified due to the fact that the distance of Earth from the Sun alone cannot be the only thing that makes Earth habitable. We still need to add more components and more factors to explain Earth's habitability. So this is our hierarchy of model and from it we've covered the first part which is a bare rock and then now we are adding the acidic atmosphere to the bare rock which we found to be too cold to be habitable. So on this call later talk I am going to add light and air so that I can warm air for a little bit, just so it can be warm enough for it to be habitable. So first, let me give you an outline of my presentation so that you can know what will be discussed on this call lecture talk. So first, I'll talk about air, which is a mixture of particles which are always in constant rapid motion, and are helpful to the air by the Earth's gravitational force, forming a thin blanket known as the atmosphere. And then I'll talk about light, which can either behave as a wave or a particle, and this is called wave-particle duality. So light can have a long wavelength or short wavelength. So have you ever wondered why the sky is blue and sunsets are red? Well, I used to, but then now I don't, because I know. And if you also want to know, stay tuned. So the interaction between light and air also leads to a phenomenon known as the greenhouse effect. So I'll also talk about that, and then because I know how most of our brain works, I'll also end things off by giving you a brief summary of my presentation, just to refresh your memory a little bit. So now let's get started. What is air? Air is something that we can feel, we cannot see, but we can see the space it occupies, like a balloon, or this plastic bag here, it is filled with air. <laughs> air is a mixture of different gases, elements, and atoms or molecules, held together to form a particle. What kind of particle? This kind of particle, which are always in constant rapid motion and are held close to the Earth by the Earth's gravitational force. So air is comprised of different gas molecules, which are all very important to our lives. So among those gases, there are main ones, such as nitrogen, which contributes 78% of the air and is very important as it provides nutrients for the plant. And then we have oxygen, which contributes 21%, and it's also very important as we need it to survive. If it wasn't for oxygen, I wouldn't be giving you this college to talk, no, would you be listening to it? We did. And then we have 0.9% of argon, and the remaining 0.1% is for other gases, such as carbon dioxide, ozone, hydrogen, neon, helium, methane, krypton, and nitrite oxide. So when air is held close to the air by the Earth's gravitational force, a thin blanket is formed, which is known as the atmosphere. So during the day, the atmosphere acts as a shield, which protects air from harmful sun rays. And during the night, it traps the infrared radiation from exiting the air, keeping the, warm, the air warm. So there are five layers of the atmosphere, namely troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, and exosphere. So this diagram here is illustrating the layers of the atmosphere, where on the y-axis here, we have the altitude in kilometers, and on the x-axis, we have the temperature in degrees Celsius. So the layer which is closest to the Earth's surface is the troposphere, which is the layer you're sitting at right now. 
this leg sensor about 10 kilometers above the earth surface and has a temperature of minus 60 degrees Celsius. So within this layer, clouds are formed and weather phenomena is experienced. So as we move up the altitude in this layer, the temperature declines, which explains why the highest mountains are snowy at the top, like Mount Everest. So if you have a planning on climbing uh, Mount Everest, just imagine you're going along some warm cold. So the second layer is the stratosphere. The stratosphere extends to about 50 kilometers above the Earth surface and has a temperature of zero degrees Celsius. So within this layer, we find the ozone layer. An ozone layer, just like an umbrella, which protects us from the sun and the wind, it protects the Earth from harmful UV radiation from the sun. The third layer, which is the middle layer, is the mesosphere. Mesosphere extends to about 80 kilometers above the Earth's surface and has a temperature of minus 85 degrees Celsius. So within this layer, we find meteor showers, which some of us call shooting stars. So in this layer, this meteor showers burn up. The fourth layer, which extends to about 500 kilometers above the Earth's surface, is the thermosphere. The thermosphere has a temperature of about 1,500 degrees Celsius. And within this layer, there is dry air. The outermost layer is the exosphere. In the exosphere, we find satellites. In South Africa, we have very beautiful mountains, such as Drakensberg Mountain and Table Mountain, which arise from the ocean and allows us to study the change in the temperature of the atmosphere. So these two beautiful mountains here are from South Africa where we have the Drakensberg Mountain on the left and Table Mountain on the right. So now the next aspect of my presentation is light. So light is a very strange thing. We cannot see it but we use it to see. So throughout ages many researchers have taken up the challenge of trying to find out what light is. So I will try to explain what light is by telling you a story about this discovery, and we will call it the discovery of light. So among the scientists who have taken up the challenge is Euclid, who on the 500 to 300 BC, he came forth and proposed the theory that light is the magic beam that comes from our eyes and shoots in straight lines. So this diagram here is just illustrating what Euclid was talking about, where we have an eye here which is shooting out light in straight lines. So this theory went on for a thousand years until in the 1600 to 1800 century, a scientist known as Newton, he came forth and falsified Euclid's theory and said, but we cannot see in the dark, nor can we see full corners. So that cannot be true. So instead, he brought forth his own theory that light is made up of tiny particles which are always in constant rapid motion. So this diagram here is just illustrating the colorful particles that Newton was talking about. So in the 1600th century again, a scientist known as Huygens, he came forth and opposed Newton's theory and then said, no, light is a wave. So this scientist discovered the wave theory of light, which was proven by Thomas Sun in the 1800s to 1900th century, that's a hundred years later. So he proved this using the double slit experiment. So in the double slit experiment, uh, he discovered that a light goes through a vacuum and behaves as a wave. So in this double slit experiment, light is shown through two slits, resulting in band being projected on the screen. And these bands have waves. So based on this experiment, he concluded that light is a wave. So Thomas Young also discovered the electromagnetic wave theory. So in the electromagnetic wave theory, he realized that a wave interacts with electricity and magnetism. So this diagram here is illustrating the electromagnetic wave, where we have a plane of magnetic field and a plane of electric field, field which are moving in the same direction. And whenever this field moves, they interact with each other, colliding with each other, producing light. A hundred years later, in the 1900th century, a scientist known as Albert Einstein, he came forth and proposed his theory that light 
that was thought to only be a wave is also a stream of particles. So by this proposal, Albert Einstein opposed Thomas Young and Hoyt's theory that light is a wave. So Albert Einstein used photoelectric effect to explain and prove his proposition. So when light is shown in a metal surface, it causes emission of electrons. So electrons knock off one another, like in a game of pool, producing the light or electrons. Okay, now here's the thing. I really love stories with a happy ending. But uh, in this one, the scientists are opposing each other. Some are saying light is a wave, while others are saying light is, is a particle. So how do we solve the problem? With wave particle duality. So quantum mechanics tells us that light can behave as both a wave and a particle. However, there has never been an experiment able to capture both meters of light at the same time. Instead, they were, be, they were able to be proven separately. So light as a particle was proven by Albert Einstein by the photoelectric effect experiment, and light as a wave was proven by Thomas Young by the double slit experiment. So this wave particle duality is just a model, but it is very useful to us. So in this collective talk, we'll focus on light as a wave. So when we say light, we are actually referring to the visible light which is the middle part of our electromagnetic spectrum. An electromagnetic spectrum is an energy in the form of electromagnetic radiation. An electromagnetic radiation is composed of an enormous range of wavelengths and frequencies, where we have the radio waves with the longest wavelength and low frequency and the highest, lowest energy. And then we have the gamma rays with the shortest wavelength, high frequency and highest energy. In the middle part here, we have the visible light. So the visible light ranges from color red with the longest wavelength and color blue or violet with the shortest wavelength. So our human eyes can only see visible light because it's the light our eyes have evolved to see. So now, let's refresh our memories a little bit. First, we talked about air, which is made up of particles which are always concentrated in motion. And then we talked about light, where we have those with short wavelengths and those with long wavelengths. And then now what happens when this light, so light from the sun can either be reflected, absorbed, or scattered. Do you remember when I told you that I'll tell you why the sky is blue? Well, this is it. So the Rayleigh scattering is the type of scattering which explains the blue sky, which I'll explain to you in just a moment. So what happens when this light from the sun reaches Earth? The white light from the sun is made up of different colors, ranging from color red with a long wavelength and color violet with the shortest wavelength. So this white light from the sun can either be reflected, absorbed, or scattered. So when light is reflected, it bounces up to a different direction, like when we see ourselves in the mirror. And when light is absorbed, it is taken in and it is released. So this explains why we see the uh, leaves as the color of green. The scattering is when light passes through and spreads in different directions, which explains why we see the sky as blue and blue. The type of scattering which explains why the sky is blue is really scattering. Scattering depends on the size of particles compared with the wavelength of the light. Because of gravity, the particles which are smallest are found on the upper layer and the particles which are largest are found next to the Earth's surface. So when light strikes gas molecules such as nitrogen and oxygen, light with the longest wavelength, like the ray, easily passes through and light with the shortest wavelength, such as violet and blue, is absorbed and scattered in different directions. Thus, we see the sky as being a blue, a blue color. So this phenomenon is known as the Rayleigh scattering. The Rayleigh scattering is named after physicists include as John Williams, also known as Lord Rayleigh. But the light with the shortest wavelength is violet. Why don't we see the sky as being a violet color instead of a blue color? Our human eyes are more receptive to the blue frequencies than the violet frequencies, so thus we see the sky as being a blue color instead of a violet color. 
but it is believed that other insects, such as the bee, can see the sky as the another color, possibly the violet color. The reason why sunset fires is the position in which the sun is entering sunset and the distance that it has to travel to reach to us. For during sunset, the sun is closer to the earth's surface, where the longest or largest particles are at. These largest particles interact with the longest wavelength, which gets scattered, causing the sky to become living or red. Another thing that makes South Africa special is the sunset and sunburn, which happen or occur over the sea. So this is the west coast and the east coast where the sunrise and sunset are happening. So you can see for a sunset, this place is so beautiful. So the interaction between light and air leads to a phenomenon known as the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is the warming of the air surface that results in solar radiations to affect the atmosphere. Greenhouse gases are the gas molecules which are responsible for the warming of the earth's surface and the atmosphere by trapping the long wave radiation. In this diagram, we are destroying the greenhouse effect, where we have the sun and the setting sun. So the sun emits solar radiation, which passes through the atmosphere through the layers of the greenhouse gases to the earth's surface. So in the earth's surface, the earth absorbs the solar radiation and it becomes warmed up. The Earth's surface then re emits the solar radiation in the form of long wave radiation. The greenhouse gases then absorb this uh, long wave radiation and vibrate, hitting the Earth. As you can see, see how these little guys are very excited, they are actually dancing. So then, the uh, long wave radiation is lost to space while some is uh, reabsorbed by, by the Earth and warms it. So the greenhouse effect is important as it keeps the earth warm. Okay now, let me just ask you, you forgot some of the stuff I said. So let me give you a summary of my presentation. So I said air is made up of particles, which are always in constant state of motion, and are held close to the earth by the earth's gravitational force, forming a blanket known as the atmosphere. So light can be made as both a wave and a particle, and this is called wave particle duality. So the blue sky is formed by the rays scattered, and the interaction between light and air can lead to a phenomenon known as the greenhouse effect, which explains the warming of the air by the greenhouse gases, which led to air being way too hot now to be habitable. So I also say that South Africa is special because there are mountains which arise from the oceans, which enables us to study about the atmosphere, the temperature of the atmosphere. So now, since Earth is now way too hot to be habitable, we need to add some more components, we need to add some more factors to make it habitable. So what is missing? I can also find out in the next talk, which is the atmospheric circulation.